Друзі, вітаю. Ми трішки візьмемо часу, щоб розпочати наш захід. Бачу, що багато з вас долучаються. Тому поки ви долучаєтесь, ми скористаємось цим часом для того, щоб перевірити якість нашого зв'язку і вирішити кілька організаційних питань. Мене звати Мар'яна Коміцька, я керівник розвитку талантів Академії ДТЕК, а також відповідаю за взаємодію Академії з зовнішнім ринком і з міжнародним ринком. І, власне, сьогодні ми маємо честь вітати спікера топового рівня Дарину Аджимоглу з відкритою лекцією про перезавантаження світового порядку. Але перед тим, як ми перейдемо до самої лекції, перед тим, як я передам вітальне слово виконавчому директору ДТЕК, я вас попрошу поставити плюс у чаті, якщо ви мене чуєте і бачите добре. Тобто два плюс. Давайте поставимо два плюси, то я це знатиму, що, що ви мене і чуєте, і бачите. Оскільки у нас сьогодні формат вебінару, то чат нам знадобиться для взаємодії. Це буде нашим єдиним каналом взаємодії. Я буду вдячна за ваші думки, коментарі в чаті. Я їх усіх обов'язково озвучу у кінці лекції. І якщо у вас будуть запитання, також туди їх пишіть, Дарин з радістю відповість. Ми організуємо наш сьогоднішній захід таким чином, щоб в нас залишилося 20-25 хвилин на ваші запитання. Чудово. Наша сьогоднішня лекція буде англійською мовою з можливістю синхронного перекладу. Ви можете нас чути, слухати у Зумі, а також на Фейсбуці. Ті, хто нас слухає у Зумі, ви можете вибрати українську мову внизу, є такий значок глобуса. Тоді ви чутимете український переклад. Якщо ж ви хочете слухати лекцію мовою оригіналу, то залишайтеся в англійському каналі. Зараз моя колега Анна продублює посилання на Zoom у Facebook, і ті, хто нас слухає в Facebook, зможуть також перейти в Zoom і вибрати переклад, тому що у Facebook автоматично буде захід мовою оригіналу. Перед тим, як я передам слово і Дмитру, і нашому спікеру, я хочу також сказати, що ми маємо сьогодні хорошу новину для усіх, хто до нас долучився. Ви знаєте, що одна з книг Дарена «Вузький коридор» була перекладена українською мовою видавництвом «Наш формат». І вони люб'язно погодились надати нам 15 книг безкоштовно для розіграшу серед сьогоднішніх учасників. Тому ем, зараз моя колега надійшла посилання і в Zoom, і в Фейсбуці, щоб ви могли зареєструватися. Всі, хто бажає прийняти участь у розіграші, і в кінці я передам їй слово, щоб ми визначили переможців і передали вам ці книги, де би ви могли почерпнути більше інформації, або ті, хто ще не читав роботи Дерена, могли з ними ознайомитися вперше. Ем, і так, я... Просто трішки скажу, що Академія ДТЕК має таку честь і можливість залучати найкращі, найкращих мислителів світу для того, щоб ми разом побрейнстормили і подумали, як нам далі відновлювати країну після війни, як відновлювати бізнес, як відновлювати і себе, і себе, бізнес і країну в тому числі. Тому це вже загалом наша не перша така зустріч, не перша лекція, але вперше ми запросили Дерена і дуже йому вдячні, що він знайшов свій, виділив час, знайшов можливість можливість поділитися своїми думками. Я хочу передати слово Дмитру Сахаруку, виконавчому директору ДТЕК, для вступного слова і для того, щоб передати далі Дерену. Дмитро? Дякую, Мар'яна. Знаєте, я думаю, що сьогоднішня лекція, вона як дуже, є дуже-дуже актуальною, тому що... Напевне, той історичний момент, який переживає Україна, як країна, випадає на долю ну, зовсім невелику кількості країн. І країна зараз дуже достойно тримається, дуже достойно представляє себе. Тому що 24 лютого почалася не просто війна Росії з Україною, а почалася, по-перше, війна України за свою незалежність за європейський вибір і за наше майбутнє. Якщо подивитися на це, на цю подію в такому масштабі глобальному, то це, по суті, є війна двох світів. Війна авторитаризму проти демократії, війна деспотії проти свободи і, напевне, війна минулого проти майбутнього. 
Я вважаю, що стратегічно Україна вже перемогла, тому що ми зберегли державу, ми її укріпили, як, напевно, перший раз за 31 рік Україна з'єднана, як ніколи, є шалена підтримка влади, президента, Збройних сил України, які, якими, напевне, пишаються всі українці зараз. І вже ніхто навіть не звертає увагу на те, що до 24 лютого вважалося найкращою чи, най... чи другою армією світу, да? Я говорю про російську армію, тому що Збройні сили України показали, що вони найкращі і краще навіть другу армію світу. Тепер завдання є, звичайно, звільнити наші території, які були окуповані, повернутися до кордонів 91-го року, про, це, про що говорить президент, про що, напевно, мріє кожен українець і хоче, щоб це трапилося якомога швидше. Звичайно, зараз кожен, кожен українець, кожна компанія намагається допомогти Збройним силам України і країні в цілому зробити це. По-перше, вистояти, по-друге, звільнити території, по-третє, почати розбудову. Ми, як компанія ДТЕК, вже з початку року, з початку війни, вибачте, ну, допомагаємо чи можемо, да? і передали майже 200 автомобілів, які у нас є. Ми вже спрямували більше ніж 500 мільйонів гривень на то, щоб для того, щоб допомогти Збройним силам України, а також надати гуманітарну підтримку населенню і це і бронежилети, і каски, і турнікети, і дрони, і пальне, і продукти харчування, і гуманітарні набори. Ми також надаємо електричну енергію Збройним силам України, медичним закладам на тих територіях, де ми працюємо. І це зараз завдання всіх українців. Кожен українець робить, що він може для того, щоб підтримати. Я цим дуже пишаюся і вдячний, напевно, кожному українці, кожній компанії, які долучаються до підтримки нашої, нашої збройних сил і нашої перемоги. Але це сьогодення, те, що ми зараз робимо, надалі буде дуже актуальним і вже зараз, напевно, є актуальним питання, а яким чином буде країна жити після перемоги? Яким чином ми будемо відбудовувати країну і яким чином ми будемо змінювати порядок, у якому, відповідно до якого буде жити країна? Очевидно, що він буде іншим, ніж до 24 лютого. І дуже багато зараз, я думаю, людей замислюється над тим, а як краще це зробити, яким чином не втратити цей унікальний шанс єднання націй. Тому що є такі зрозумілі речі, як відбудова, відбудова пошкоджених будинків чи відбудова критичної інфраструктури. А є більш глобальні речі про те, яким чином мають працювати державні інституції, яким чином мають, має бізнес взаємодіяти з державними інституціями, як має розвиватися суспільство яким чином Україна має інтегруватися у європейську спільноту. Тому що, по суті, в якомусь плані війна, яка зараз йде, це і боротьба за європейський вибір українського народу. Так, є речі, які ми робимо вже зараз, наприклад, компанія наша, ми за рекордні 45 днів відбудували пошкоджену інфраструктуру в Київській області, після того, як території будуть звільнені на початку квітня. Це майже півтори тисячі кілометрів лінії тропередач, майже тисячі підстанцій, які змінили. Багато інших компаній роблять те ж саме. Багато мостів вже відбувала держава, багато компаній відбудували пошкоджені майно. Але це, це така проста, зрозуміла історія – відбудувати те, що було. Зараз потрібно подивитися на те, а яким чином не жити минулим, а жити майбутнім. І тут, безумовно, критичним є залучення інвестицій. Я вірю в те, що таким драйвером розвитку країни після відбудови країни після війни буде, перш за все, будь приватні гроші або приватний сектор. Звичайно, публічний сектор чи державний сектор має бути, але співвідношення має бути там 20 чи 10 на 90 у бік приватного сектора. Але приватні інвестиції, приватний сектор, він просто так не прийде в країну. Потрібна довіра, потрібна довіра і передбачуваність з боку держави. І це м, така вічна проблема, яка у нас є, тому що не так легко створити клімат привабливий, інвестиційний в країні. Зараз велика конкуренція є між країнами, 
всі залучають гроші і грошей у світі багато. А яким чином зробити так, щоб країна стала привабливою країною для інвестицій, для приватних грошей? Це велике питання, велике завдання. І тут, напевно, потрібна така гарна фахова дискусія з, з, з експертами, спеціалістами. Потрібно чути їх і потрібно враховувати думки. Тому що, незважаючи на те, що Україна має свій власний шлях розвитку, є загально прийняті закони економіки, політики, які неможливо змінити, які ми, які ми маємо враховувати для того, щоб створити Україну, зробити так, щоб вона була інвестиційно приваблива для, для інвесторів. Для того, щоб сюди поверталися українці, для того, щоб тут відновлювалася економіка, для того, щоб у нас почала працювати, працювати знов економіка не в такому, знаєте, стані, аби вижити, а щоб був розвиток. Нам потрібно, щоб приїзд фаловий продукт темпами плюс 10% для того, щоб ми змогли надолужити те, що ми втратили через війну. І я вважаю, що це можливо. Абсолютно можливо, тому що те, як яке диво показала нація під час спочатку війни, зіпоєднавшись, підтримавши ЗСУ, те диво, яке показала Збройні сили України. Щось мені підказує, що таке ж диво можна створити і в економіці. Якщо ми створимо правильну, збалансовану систему взаємодії між бізнесом і державою, між суспільством і державою, і Україна має 100% шанси бути лідером європейської сім'ї, куди ми так прагнемо. Це абсолютно реально. Але потрібно це зробити все правильно, розумно, враховуючи досвід поколінь, враховуючи досвід спеціалістів. І тому сьогодні у нас є унікальний шанс послухати одного з відомих експертів, економістів. Я думаю, ну, напевне, один з найкращих таких мислителів сьогодення в сфері економіки. І е, я певен, що думки, які будуть сьогодні поширені, які будуть е, надані, вони будуть вкрай важливі для всіх нас, для України, для того, щоб не лише відбудувати те, що було знищене, а створити нову Україну, створити нові, е, нову економіку, нову державу, нове суспільство, яке буде сильним, незалежним і яке буде завжди мріяти про нові досягнення, нові рубежі, а не жити майбутнім, як живе наш зараз ворог. Тому з вдячністю до Академії за організацію цієї лекції передаю слово нашому спікеру для того, щоб ми почали, почали нашу, нашу лекцію. Дякую. Дякую, дякую, пане Дмитро. Дарин, now the floor is yours. So we would be glad if you just tell us your thoughts and views on remaking of the world order after the war. What the new society and rules will look like? What is in your view the cooperation between the state and society? How we shall interact with government institutions and how this trinity, government, business and society have interact? And what is the most important for us? What is the place of Ukraine? at the international stage. And in your view, what is the future of democracy in Ukraine and in the world, in the new uh, world order? Well, thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you to DTEC for inviting me. I'm very happy and proud to be talking to a Ukrainian audience in this very important time for the Ukrainian people, for the Ukrainian state and democracy. Of course, we have just passed the six month mark of this senseless brutal war and uh, uh, I'm happy that uh, many in the West are standing next to Ukraine and there is much to discuss about the causes of the war from the Russian side, you know what's happening in the war, the effects of sanctions and of course uh, the economy in Ukraine right now and hopefully after the war how it can be rebuilt but I want to uh spend my uh half hour 35 minutes here uh talking about something else about why the ukrainian war matters for one of the most important thing for the 21st century the future of democracy and uh, geopolitical order and in fact i think the remaking of the world order 
is very much about the role of democracy and uh, what Ukraine's role is, why Ukraine matters. And in fact, putting the whole sort of crisis of democracy in context, why uh, democracy is important for the 21st century, but why it's in crisis both in the West and in the developing world. In 1960, about 30% of the countries were democratic according to international organizations, but things were changing, especially as you know, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the political scientist Francis Fukuyama declared in 1999, end of history and a victory of liberal capitalism with, together with democratic institutions. And in fact, even before the collapse of Soviet Union, there was a, uh, large movement towards democracy all around the world. This is what another political scientist, uh, Samuel Huntington called the third way of democratization, uh, which started after the, the fall of military dictatorships in Southern Europe, Greece, uh, Spain, and Portugal. And by 2000, democratization was maturing in around the world, uh, including in some former Soviet satellite countries and the number of democracies had risen to 60%. But since then, we are in a crisis of democracy. According to one of the many organizations, Freedom House, but the data from uh, others are very, very similar. Democracy is in strong retreat uh, since around 2006. Every year since 2006, more countries have left democratic institutions behind towards authoritarian non-democratic uh, structures or their democracies have weakened. So for example, in this figure, you see in pink, those where democracy is moving back. Every year, more countries are moving back in democracy relative to the few numbers in blue whose democracies are somehow getting stronger despite the, uh, uh, the, the, the tensions against democracy. Ukraine, uh, again, I'll come back to Ukraine in a second, but you know, over the last 10 years was uh, many times in the blue category. And in fact, it's one of the countries where we see democratization uh, making important steps, but why many other countries are going in different directions. And in fact, Ukraine had a very hard time uh, in consolidating democracy, I think are related to broader set of issues. In fact, those forces, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit soon, is not just affecting the emerging world. In, in the developed world that you see, democracy having a hard time. This is both on the basis of objective measures and the feelings of uh, citizens, their views, their trust in institutions, in many developed nations. So here, I'm just showing it for a number of countries uh, from Europe. In all of them, you see that there is a slight trend down in democratic uh, indices. These indices now from a different organization uses various dimensions of democracy, including sort of protection of minorities, protection of rights and so on. But the country that I'm showing in black here is the one that's most remarkable. It's the United States. There has been a unprecedented deterioration in the United States democracy since around the mid 2010s. And of course, Donald Trump's rise was at least part of this and all sorts of norms and institutions that have been weakened uh, are part of it. But it's not just a problem of the objective measures, even more worrying moving into the 21st century is the attitudes for, of people towards democracy. So in this picture, uh, let's just focus, since time is short, let's just focus on the US, but uh, I'm showing the UK and I could have shown other countries uh, because they have a slightly similar but much, much less pronounced pattern. So it's sort of a point of contrast. What I'm showing here is the support among people of different ages for democratic institutions, how much they uh, prefer it to autocratic institutions and how much they think democracy is a better system. And uh, you see that even in the, uh, in the 1990s, there are a lot of people who you know, uh, didn't think so, but the majority of the population 
uh, was of the view that democracy was a better system. But you see here in 2017, after Donald Trump's election, and again, Donald Trump's election, I think has to be seen in the context of a broader changes, which I'm gonna talk about, uh, the, the fraction of people from each one of these age groups has halved that support democracy. Now, one reason for this might be exactly what uh, you might uh, have read over the last 10 years in uh, discussions, in uh, blogs, in newspapers, that somehow democracy has underdelivered in terms of economic growth. In fact, many philosophers going back to Plato and Aristotle uh, have been very suspicious of democracy. It's a chaotic system. It cannot reach consensus. It can turn into mob rule. And many political scientists and economists have sort of uh, endorsed this sort of view. Uh, either political rights don't have any effect on growth, but or it might actually be a negative effect. And this is uh, exactly what you know the propaganda from the Chinese government or uh, Vladimir Putin's regime in Russia have been over the last ten years that democracy is not a good system for anybody, but certainly not uh, for people uh, of uh, Soviet, former Soviet Republic, or China and Asia, or perhaps Africa. But in fact, the reality is very different. And I just want to show you again a little bit of data because the data are so clear. Uh, and what I do here is I take GDP per capita of all the countries that start out as non democratic. And then I take those that become a democracy and I say the year of democratization is year zero and I compare their GDP per capita and its evolution in the years after democratization to all the other countries that remain non-democracy. So there's no a statistical procedure here it's just a raw data. I just normalize things so that the year of democratization is zero for every country. And then you're making the comparison to other countries in the same year that remain non-democracy. And the pattern is actually very, very clear. Of course, it takes a little bit of time, but after about five years, countries that democratize start a rapid process of economic growth. And by around 20, 25 years after democratization, they have become about 20% richer than they would have been or than other countries that remain non-democratic. So in the raw data, at least, uh, there is a very strong pattern where democracies are doing better than non-democracy. Well, there is another interesting feature here in the data, which is actually one of the reasons why sometimes people have been confused about what democracy does to economic growth, is that before democratization, before this is zero, there's a drop in GDP in the countries that are going to democratize. That's actually a very important telltale sign of the problems of democracy that we are going to talk about in the rest of this talk. It reflects the fact that even though democracy is actually good for economic growth, non-democratic regimes, people like the well, people like Putin or uh, Viktor Orban or Erdogan in Turkey or the Chinese Communist Party, typically don't democratize out of their own volition. Democratization happens when there is an economic crisis or hardship that destabilizes non-democratic regimes. And that highlights one of the major issues that I want to emphasize. Democracy is good for growth and we'll see generally good for the poor, for health, for education, but it is often opposed by political elites that benefit from non-democratic regimes. Now, if instead of looking at the raw data, you do formal statistical analysis, you end up with the same feature. This is 
years after democratization, after a simple uh, statistical model is uh, estimated, and you see that about 20, 25% increase in about 20, 25 years after democratization. Let me skip that. Uh, it's not just income. There are many other things that change after democracy. Redistribution, taxes increase, uh, redistribution programs such as social security, investments in education and health. And you see more or less at the same frequency as you observe the benefits of democracy on economic growth, improvements in health. For example, child mortality declines quite dramatically after about 15 years or so following democratization. So why democracy is challenging? I think everything here has to be viewed in light of the groups that do not want democratic institutions, either because of their economic interests, because they want political control, or because they are ideologically opposed to democracy, but these groups have always been present. So you have to think about what is it that's making people in the West and many in the developing world turn against democracy? What are the economic forces that after the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, for example, that brought people like Yanukovych back to power? And I think four set of forces are worth discussing. They don't always play the same role in every country. In some instances, some have been more important than others, but these four are shaping the future of democracy in our current world. Inequality, globalization, social media, and new technologies, and the new geopolitics. And the new geopolitics is where, of course, Russia, China, and Ukraine fit, and I'm gonna spend some time on that. Inequality. Let me just show you some aspects of inequality because I think it's going to be important for the future of Ukrainian democracy as well. So you see, for example, here in the US that economic structure has changed quite dramatically since the 1980s. Before then, you had that real wages for all demographic group, all skill groups were growing in tandem about two and a half percentage points every year in real terms. And since 1980, you have a dramatic pattern, real wages of low education workers, people with high school degree, less than high school, and even those with a couple of years of college actually dramatically declining. The rise of Donald Trump of new populist authoritarianism, a country in, in, in government that actually supported Russia for the first time in the US, uh, modern US history. Well, that cannot be understood without this economic hardships that really change the nature of politics in the US. This is not just a US phenomenon. If you look at other more comprehensive measures of inequality, such as the Gini coefficient, you see it in almost all industrialized nations. Why look at the Gini coefficient rather than say real wages at the bottom? Well, US is actually unique in such dramatic drops in real wages because it does not have high minimum wages or strong protective institutions for low wage workers or for workers in general. So other countries haven't had this sort of dramatic drops at the bottom, but they've had increases in inequality almost uniformly. Moreover, in all of these cases, again, something I think that's going to become relevant for the future of Ukraine once the war is over and democracy is being rebuilt, economic changes have also impacted the middle classes. If you, uh, classify occupations into low wage, high wage, and middle class occupations. In almost all developed industrialized nations, middle class occupations have been shrinking. And either there are more low wage occupations ex uh, expanding, sometimes some more higher wage occupations. But in all of these cases, these red show clerical workers, office workers, back office workers, and blue color workers becoming less and less important in the economy. Globalization has been a major driver of this. And uh, for example, with import competition for low wage nations such as China, it has directly impacted the economic structure, inequality, job losses, but it has also had, I think, a bigger set of social effects. 
globalization has been the nexus of growing aspirations. After all, remember globalization was presented to many people, many populations as a force that was going to create shared prosperity, much better economic welfare, much better integration. But together with those high aspirations, reality has been quite different. These aspirations have not been met. In many cases, globalization has had some benefits, but the benefits did not measure up to what was uh, promised. But at the same time, it created a lot of discontent and backlash. Some of it is because of the general pains of modernization. Some of it because of the clash between new ideas, new models, new lifestyles that are being made salient by globalization and the traditional norms. And there is growing evidence that globalization has been one of the factors, not the only one, but one of the factors that has fueled the rise of right-wing populism. For example, there are several recent works showing that in Italy, the UK, the US, uh, and many other nations, increased imports from China have fueled polarization and right-wing populism. Social media has been another factor. Uh, you know, propaganda is as old as a government. You know, pamphlets and uh, speeches were used way before any type of mass communication device was was used. The printing press was used for propaganda from the beginning, not least by Martin Luther himself. Uh, but social media has expanded and changed the nature of these. Uh, as many of you have been. Uh, quite aware, misinformation and propaganda have been an integral part of social media pretty much anywhere. Some of it fueled by Russia, some of it fueled by the US, some of it fueled by China. But it's not just propaganda by authoritarian actors. Just the general nature of misinformation and falsehoods has shaped the nature of this uh, discourse, political discourse on social, social media. For example, a, uh, a study of political news on Facebook finds that often because of sensationalist content, falsehoods spread much faster. For example, if you look at just focusing here on the panel B for, uh, for concreteness, although the same, this part is very interesting as well. If you look at, <clears throat> the size of the audience for truthful content in green, it very rarely exceeds about 2,000 people. If you look at demonstrably false content, it often reaches something close to 100,000 people easily. And why? because of the sensationalist nature and because of the algorithms of social media prof, uh, 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 sources, prop, uh, 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 platforms such as Facebook, falsehoods get amplified and boosted. And this has made anti-democratic forces very strong. Propaganda about why, uh, why sometimes you know, there, are, there is hardship, why there is inequality, what you know, globalization is bringing or what demo, how democracy is working, all this sort of misinformation can sometimes reach huge audiences because of the nature of social media. But even worse, social media has allowed a new sort of populist playbook, which you see, you know, I'll come back to Russia in a second because it's not a classic populist regime, but you know, in much more clearly in places like Modi in India, Erdogan in Turkey, or Bolsonaro in Brazil, they have been able to use social media to amplify nationalist polarizing rhetoric and building a specific political niche. The most extreme example in Myanmar, for example, ethnic cleansing and murder of Rohingya Muslim being organized on Facebook using exactly the same sort of methods that Trump used in the US or Trump supporters or, or sometimes Russian bots supporting Trump have used in the US or Bolsonaro in Brazil. In fact, technology is really changing the nature of 
politics both under authoritarian and democratic institutions. In the mid 2000s, as online communication methods were spreading, there was an optimism that wikis, Facebook, uh, online communication would generally make protests and information more widely available and threaten authoritarianism. But actually the opposite appears to have happened. Chinese Communist Party today is much more successful in quelling any type of protests. It's become the largest investor in AI, mostly aimed at facial recognition and monitoring surveillance. Here is Tiananmen Square, very peaceful, no more protests there. And the social credit system where continuous data collection about people and especially their untrustworthy political or social behavior is used for uh, them being fired or allowed to travel or getting government jobs is one of the next horizons. So in fact, some people have now gone to the other extreme from the optimism of the uh, 2007, 2008, uh, after especially 2010, after the initial uh, Arab Spring. Some like most uh, uh, visibly historian Yuval Noah Harari have now made the opposite prediction saying that new technology and in particular an AI is creating a, a digital dictatorship and not just in China. Now, China is very important and I'm gonna come back to this, not just because it's emblematic of these changes, but uh, it's also become a nexus of these surveillance technologies, not just being developed, but being exported. So just Huawei, for example, has exported surveillance technologies to more than 50 non-democratic countries. So this brings me to the last item the new world order. And here, of course, for Ukrainian people, the main threat was and has been over the last six months, Russia, which is an existential danger to Ukraine's democracy, Ukraine's future, to Ukrainian people. But I think it is useful to put this slightly more broadly and think of China and Russia. And I think what unites China and Russia is as important as what divides them. And what divides them is not irrelevant, and I'll come back to that. But <clears throat> it's that these are two very powerful, important countries, geopolitically, Russia not so much economically anymore, but certainly geopolitically and militarily. It's an effort to create a new world order hostile to democracy. Of course, Russian's democracy could set back, hopefully it won't, but could set back the burgeoning Ukrainian democracy, and it is already increasing the strength of authoritarian countries in Eastern Europe, such as Hungary. And China's influence has expanded tremendously over the last six years, uh, not just as direct support to authoritarian regimes in Africa and Asia, but as an indirect uh, information campaign. But why is anti-democracy so important to China and Russia? I think in both cases, you have to view this as both a geopolitical issue and a domestic issue. China is a rising power and the main challenge is to maintain domestic stability but that, of course, to the leadership means control of the Chinese Communist Party. But this is not an easy problem. <clears throat> Early stages of Chinese development was in a context driven by export growth and a very small middle class. Today, the Chinese middle class is the biggest in the world. And it's getting richer. Its aspirations are growing. So in this context, maintaining the kind of Chinese Communist Party's dominance is a very challenging matter. In fact, the rise of President Xi and his more authoritarian model of control, much tighter surveillance, 
in social media, in print media, much greater control over institution, over uh, higher education institutions, universities in China. I think these are not surprising steps when you view the dynamics of China as this effort to maintain an authoritarian regime in the face of a rising middle class. But to maintain authoritarianism at home, China needs to oppose democracy abroad to develop a new model of government. And the problem is that this is a very treacherous affair. In the international relations, the tensions that it creates are sometimes called the Thucydides' trap after the famous uh, Greek historian of the Peloponnesian War. In particular, Thucydides' trap is about the changing <clears throat> world order, dangerous world order when one hegemonic power, the US in this instance, is in decline and a new one, China, is rising to rival it or partially rival it. And these new balances are always destabilizing even when they are unsuccessful. Russia is in a different boat, but it's actually having a very parallel influences on the world new geopolitical order, not just in Ukraine, but much more broadly. In Syria, in former Soviet republics such as Kazakhstan, uh, perhaps even increasingly in other parts of the world. The problem for Russia is the opposite in the sense that Russia is a declining power. Economically, it's actually going to become weaker and weaker, and that would have been true even without the sanctions. The only thing keeping the Russian economy going is actually natural resources, oil and gas. But it is much stronger politically and geopolitically than its economic power indicates. And this creates the opposite of the tension in China that it is a declining power, but in order to maintain Putin and his cronies kleptocratic rule, it needs to maintain its international influence. In the short run, it's actually this Russian dynamics that are more stay unstable. In the medium term, it's gonna be the Chinese dynamics that are more unstable. And I think this is the context in which the Ukrainian war needs to be viewed. And Ukrainian war matters greatly because the inability of China, Russia to maintain its geopolitical influence, its, its inability to actually impose its wishes would indicate at the end of an era for Russian local hegemony. And this is one of the reasons why Ukraine matters much more than just Ukrainian democracy and the, of course, livelihood, continuation, health of the Ukrainian people. It matters for the global geopolitical order. But in fact, we can put this into a broader perspective. It's an uncertain future, but we don't need to conclude that you, the future is bleak for democracy. And I want to end with just a few reflections from my more recent book with Jim Robinson, The Narrow Corridor, State Societies and the Fate of Liberty. And the main idea of that book is that you need a balance between the power of the state and power of society in order for liberties and democracy to emerge and flourish. When there is imbalance, you get much more despotic power such as China and Russia. And when that balance is broken because of the weakness of the state, you get sort of a collapse of institutions. But maintaining this balance is really hard and it has both a domestic and international aspect. 
In fact, the international aspect was always recognized, sometimes as a positive force, sometimes as a negative force. One of the most important works in political sociology that has shaped 20th, late 20th century thinking on this is by the American political scientist, uh, sociologist Charles Tilley, summarized by his statement, states made war and the war made the state. So the international order always matters, but this doesn't mean it matters without sort of agency. And in particular, it is, let me just skip that because time is getting short, but let me just emphasize that the way in which these war dynamics matter really is dependent on the local efforts, how the local people local institutions respond to the threats. Many burgeoning democratic or, or liberalizing countries have fallen prey to threats of war. But sometimes it is exactly under these sorts of dangerous, treacherous conditions that the right type of leadership, the right type of sacrifices by the people can strengthen democracy. And I think this is exactly the what the Ukrainian people right now are demonstrating to the rest of the world. But this is only the beginning, I think, of building a new type of a healthier democracy. And I think, again, Ukraine is gonna matter a lot for this. So better democracy after the Ukraine war is going to be important, not just for the security in uh, the Asia and Eurasia area, security against threats from Russia and China, but also so that both burgeoning democracies such as Ukraine and more mature democracies such as those in the West can provide a framework in which better public services, better control of economic uncertainty, better redistribution can be provided by democratic regimes. So this has to start with uh, containing inequality, creating more shared pro prosperity, this is something I've worked on a lot. I don't have the time to talk about it, but better globalization, better use of communication technologies and new norms of democratic governance and collaboration. And critically, and this is again gonna be very important for Ukraine, a new framework for countering China and Russia internationally. But differently, I don't think this is a problem of just governments in the West. It's a problem of civil society. And so much more thinking is necessary on how to build a more pro-democratic geopolitics. And I think the world will have a lot of lessons to learn from the Ukrainian war and from the Ukrainian people. Let me stop here. And I look forward to the questions in the remaining uh, 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Actually, we have a lot of questions. I thought that I will have to encourage people, but I probably will have to stop them. Otherwise, you will need the next three, four hours to answer all the questions. Um, let me start from the very beginning and then I will try to group the rest of the questions because I'm sure you will not be able to answer all of them since there are a lot. Um, so the first, the, one of the participants is asking what is the best audience to implement the main principles of democracy youth or more mature one? Well, I think the most major thing is that democracy succeeds when it actually delivers. And it's not surprising that the decline in democracy in the West has occurred exactly during the period where income growth slowed down for the middle classes, inequality increased. There was a sense that globalization did not deliver what was promised. And in fact, it was only you know, the very rich or global elites who benefited from democracy. So I think creating a more equitable set of economic outcomes from democracy is going to be a very important part of it. But then another important aspect, which is what I emphasize under building a new framework for communication technologies is how to contain propaganda. You know, Ukraine war will end, but I don't think this is going to end the propaganda war that will continue in both the uh, former Soviet republics, but also in other parts of the West. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so there are many surveys and the results of the surveys, especially in Ukraine now, saying that the majority of citizens, they are inclined to allow um, 
a little bit a decrease of democratical principles in order to accelerate the victory. So the question is, what are your thoughts about that? Is it possible? Is it allowed to sacrifice democracy in such critical moments? And will it not lead to the further power centralization? Well, that's a very important question. I think you can <clears throat> you can see that in every uh, period of national emergency. You saw that during COVID. <clears throat> you saw that <clears throat> during the time in the war on terror in the US and in Europe. And I think it's a two-edged sword. What happened in the US, for example, during the war on terror significantly weakened democracy because there was a centralization of power without corresponding checks and without any plans of how to roll it back. On the other hand, there were many things wrong in the West's response to COVID. But the centralization of power that came during COVID, for example, on orders to work from home or stay at home or wear masks, did not correspond to a permanent increase in the state's power or uh, major long-term declines in personal liberties. In fact, in some places such as Taiwan, it was exactly civil society that played a leading role in developing technologies and developing norms for how to build, believe, behave during COVID. So what that suggests for the Ukrainian case is that I think more important than the exact measures taken during the war is an institutional framework that clearly specifies that these are temporary measures and they are built on a broad consensus. So the danger is not that during a wartime there will be increasing powers of the executive, that's almost inevitable, but that these will become permanent. So I think all increases in executive powers have to be instituted together with sunset clauses, meaning clear rules that they will immediately seize as soon as the current situation ends. Uh, thank you. There is another question. I'm trying to pick up. It's connected with the previous one. That um, again, some polls show that what time Ukrainians seem to support democracy less and supporting strong leaders more. How to prevent politicians from taking advantage of this? There is uh, always a temptation to strengthen presidential power, but the entire history of independent Ukraine shows that only parliamentarism and democracy promote development. Um, and it's even more important for post-war reconstruction. Well, you know, I completely agree with the sentiments expressed in the question. It is parliamentarian systems and checks and balances, uh, strong independent judiciary that counterbalances executive power that are key for Ukraine. But my own, you know, limited experience, you know, when I visited Ukraine in the past, uh, several times, uh, I actually found, especially among the youth, a uh, deep belief in democracy. And I think during a period of crisis that a much more uh, urgent needs of trying to protect the country and defeat Russian invasion is understandable, but I'm hopeful that in the post-war reconstruction period, democratic feeling is going to come back. But the more important issue is, can that become more institutionalized? And this is where making sure that democracy actually delivers is important. You know, after all, Ukraine was a democracy in the 1990s, but it turned into a very corrupt oligarchy under democratic institutions. And if that recurs, that's when support for democracy will start declining permanently as it has done in the US or Brazil, for example. Um, there is one more question connected with democracy. That's more about thought, but also the question that we were given democracy without clearly explaining what the, the main essence is. 
Uh, I mean, the people understand the rights, but they do not understand the duties and the responsibilities. So the question is, is the situation the same from your views in other countries in the US and in Europe? Do regular citizens in the, um, the USA and Europe understand it and how it influences the democratic process worldwide? That's an excellent question. I don't think there has been enough research on this question, but I think my sense is that indeed, democracy flourishes when there is a sense of community as well. And I think a collapse of the sense of community in many places has been sort of handmaiden of declining support for democracy. And you know, what is that community? It is partly local in big countries such as Ukraine, US, you know, you need to have local democracy, local participation, but it's also national. You know, democracies occur along national borders. And, uh, you know, and the Ukrainian people right now are showing an enormous amount of sacrifice for defending their country. And I think those are good foundations on which to build a sense of democratic community. Again, there are things that are amazingly inspirational things in Ukraine on which I hope the Ukrainian people will build on in the post-war era. Thank you. And the last question connected with this, uh, what are the most widespread misleading approaches to democracy you have heard? Well, I think the most misleading, in my opinion, misleading anyway, arguments have a lot in common. They emphasize that democracies are always bound to lead to gridlock and therefore economic inefficiency. And centralization and top-down control is always better for the welfare of the people. And the reason why this is so misleading and dangerous is because there is a small grain of truth in it. You know, democracy is about building consensus and building consensus always comes with the other side of the coin, which is that it's gonna take a while to build consensus and sometimes it's not gonna work. But it is that process of trying to build consensus compromise that is key for good decision making. So even if sometimes it might appear, okay, you know, we need to make a, to build a bridge. Okay, somebody orders everybody else to build that bridge, that might appear more expedient. It really isn't in a, from a medium term perspective, because if that bridge is done by fiat, neither do we build that bridge very well, nor do you have the sort of consensus and compromise that's going to lead to say people saying, well, you know, I paid for that bridge. Is that really me benefiting from that bridge? So I think really there is a grain of truth. Of course, you can build that bridge much faster if some uh, dictator like Putin or Xi Jinping says build the bridge, but it opens the way to corruption. It opens the way to greater discord and it really fails to bring people together as a community, which again, I said, is really important for the future of countries such as Ukraine or the US. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Very uh, valuable thoughts. And now let's move to the questions connected with Ukraine and with our enemy. So let's start with the enemy because we need to fit it uh, to fight it as soon as possible. <laughs> so the question is why China, uh, why Chinese people and Russians invest a lot, um, a lot of state money into education of their citizens in UK uh, or in um, other European countries or in the USA and not build democracy, democratic and decent education system inside. Well, you know, that's a great question. And, and I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know the answer to half of that question, uh, but it's actually a much deeper set of issues there. Obviously, FSB and Putin and his cronies don't want to build democratic institutions. Their power comes from absence of democratic institutions. And independent education is, therefore their enemy. And there is growing evidence that both in China and Ukraine, universities have become much more tools for brainwashing and to some degree with great success. Now, then the one part of the answer therefore to the, this excellent question is to say, well, you know, the elites need to send their children to school and therefore you know they prefer foreign schools because the domestic ones have become propaganda machines but i think that's just too simple an answer 
I think there is a broader sense in which the existing system gets unable to deliver in terms of even the technical education that as the clampdown against freedom of thought deepens, they are going to become more and more dependent on foreign institutions. And that relationship is gonna become more and more complex because they can't even use foreign institutions because if you send people freely to foreign institutions, then they're going to start getting different ideas than the ones that Putin or the Communist Party in China want them to have. So at the same time, as you rely on foreign institutions for higher learning, you need to intensify the propaganda. And you see this in China, for example, China is now investing hundreds of millions of dollars to form what they call Confucian institutions in the US, which are essentially partly methods of control of Chinese students who study in US universities. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, thank you. Let me ask you two more questions and then I will I will uh, ask you whether we still have time or not, because like uh, formally we do not. Uh, so could you please explain in more details how to achieve full inclusive institutions in Ukraine? I'm asking this because we all understand that Ukraine has not have so far sufficient level of inclusiveness in government processes. Well, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. I think I did not know, you know, I uh, taken part in conferences in Ukraine where that question was debated uh, by not just me, but many other experts. I think it's a very difficult process. Civil society, democratic participation are very important, but also, you know, building much better judicial institutions, that's very important. I think it was a difficult process before the Ukraine war, even before the threat of the invasion by Russia was on the horizon. But of course, ex post is going to be a much harder process. You know, the east of the country, you know, it needs to be integrated much better, now much, much harder after, you know, uh, Russian invasion has deepened. There are big economic scars that the Russian invasion is going to leave. Uh, so I don't think we should expect a magic bullet sort of establishing Ukrainian democracy back to, you know, uh, where it was even in 2019, 2020, uh, immediately. Uh, but it is a process that the Ukrainian people need to be the leading force, not just politicians, but Ukrainian people. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, the last question before I ask you for more time or not, this is about the Ukrainian territory. So the, the people are asking, the participants are asking, what are your thoughts? Uh, so whether you believe that Ukraine will stay like a united uh, into its territories or it will be separated into West and East? Well, I am not a military expert, I think. You know, there are much more informed people about that. I mean, people and, are asking about, like, saying that the the West is more pro democratic and East is more pro authoritarian. Whether whether it could be the way to to stop the war or to solve the problem, into your into your views. You know, I think this is Putin's war. I don't know what would convince Putin to mm -hmm. stop the war. Uh, certainly, I never believed that sanctions would do it. Uh, and you know Putin's regime is too secure to fall any time in the near future. Is there anything that you believe could stop him or could prevent them from invading the rest of the territory of Ukraine? Uh, weakness. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you know if Putin had the power to invade the whole of Ukraine and control it, he would have done it by now. But what would convince him? to stop the war? Well, it's not an easy question to answer. Certainly he would not accept defeat because that would weaken his position. And even though he's not insecure in his position in the near future, you know, it's a 10 year, 20 year horizon that probably he has. But I don't think making concessions to him would necessarily uh, guarantee peace either. It's really difficult. I mean, I think, it's much easier to predict, you know, the Chinese Communist Party at this point than Putin. 
many uh, let, let, that's really the last question um many people are saying that when when we speak about the weakness of putin to stop the war they mean that the weakness of the regime that the russia as a republic that the only way for ukraine to get the the, the victory if the regime it falls down so what are your thoughts is it possible or not i don't think i don't think that's the right calculation right now i don't see any feasible path in the near future for the regime to fall down and if if that's the approach, I think that we have to brace for a much longer war. And of course, it's very costly for the Ukrainian people. Uh, but but as I said, you know, suing for peace by making concessions to Putin is not a uh, is, 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 is not a good strategy either, because that's not necessarily going to convince him. So it's a, it's a very delicate thing that uh, that 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 hopefully some combination of weakness but face saving by putin will convince uh his him and his uh inner circle to say okay this is it but but when will that happen i don't know mm -hmm. i see so darren thank you thank you for your lecture thank you for your questions we still have a lot of questions but i just i stop here and just want to ask you whether you can continue or we will stop here and that's it I'll, I'll I'll take two more questions and then I will have to go, unfortunately. Uh, two more questions. Okay, let me pick up the most interesting questions, probably. Um, the, the people are here, here, I saw some questions. Ah, there is an interesting question. Whether the old Europe will be ready to acknowledge the strong democratic Ukraine if we just go to this regime and take our experience for the um, reconstruction of the of its own democracy? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I hope so. I mean, I think uh, everybody I know has been so impressed and uh, inspired by the Ukrainian people's courage and uh, determination to defend their country and their democracy. And I think indeed, you know, I think uh, if you look at the data, it is especially among European youth where you see less support for democracy. In some parts of the of, in some parts of the West, and I think they have a lot to learn from the Ukrainian youth, who is sort of sacrificing so much for the Ukrainian democracy. So I do believe that support for democracy will come back in the West. I am not blindly optimistic, and I don't believe that democracy will necessarily triumph in the very long run. But I think right now we are going through a particularly tough time for Western democracy that will reverse itself to some degree if the right policies are adopted. Uh, and the last question connected with that, whether there is the interest in the USA to support the development of the open democracy in Ukraine, uh, if this process will be dangerous for the allies of Europe and the USA? Well, you know, that was one of the points that I had on my slides that I didn't get to. You know, the US support for democracy has always been much less much more nuanced. You know, US has often sacrificed democracy abroad for its geopolitical aims and supporting dictatorships in Chile, Guatemala, or actually, you know, sometimes engineering military coups in Guatemala, uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in Iran. I think the real safeguards for the international support has to come from Western civil society, not from the Western government. The Western government will have to follow the civil society for a truly uh, healthy international support for democracy. And there, you know, it is actually a good story because US civil society, you know, except extremist fringes is firmly behind Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. So it's it seems to me that this hour was like one minute. So we would be happy to listen to more and we'll be listening to your lecture once more and once more. We do appreciate your time and efforts to devote to Ukraine. We're sure that your thoughts will give us some push uh, to, to new ideas and give us strength to stand in this war, to, to be able to work and live in these conditions and to get to the victory. And as soon as we get to the victory, we will be glad to invite you once more and to celebrate this victory together with us. Thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you very much for everybody to everybody who took part on this. My pleasure and honor to be here.
Yeah. Dear friends, I just encourage you not to leave. Uh, I hope that uh, you have uh, inserted your emails to get the books. So we are saying goodbye to Darren, not just to take more of his time, but he wishes he may stay. I'm giving the word to my colleague, Anna.